This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. to the Business for Superhero Show. I'm Vicky Fraser and this week we've got a very special guest in the shape of Camilla Arguello. Camilla, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. It's great to have you here. Um, the reason that I've got Camilla on the podcast is partly to talk about what she does, but also because she's written a book and this is, after all, the 1000 Authors Show. So I want to ask her all about the book and how she wrote it and what she does. So Camilla, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Vicky. I'm excited. Um, and I'm actually drinking tea right now, which I think is fitting based on the location of where you are. Um, so I am a um, alignment and mindset coach for high performers. I'm an author. Um, I'm a speaker and I do all kinds of stuff, but really everything that I do relates around um, getting out of our heads and kind of just like getting the things that we want in life really done, um, but really identifying what those things are, um, because a lot of us base our life on the shoulds and not on the wants. So um, my job is to help people get a little bit out of it. And then my fun new slogan that I came up with on a podcast randomly last week is by day I sell things and by night I teach things um, because I'm also in sales. So I see a lot of the like practical application of things. um, And then also um, I just love working with people. So I do it everywhere. Cool. I love that. Um, I love I love the focus on wants instead of shoulds because there are way too many shoulds in the world and way too many people pointing fingers telling us what we should be doing and how we should be feeling and that we're not real business owners unless we do this, that and the other and it just makes my brain hurt. So let's talk about that a little bit. How, how does, what do you think about all of, all of the, the shoulds that are flying around, particularly at the moment? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I, so it's funny because like, this is what I do. Right. And it's what I'm really good in coaching other people to do. And yet at the beginning of all of this, I found myself wrapped up in it. Like I was really torn between, uh, my March and April were looking really packed work-wise, um, and from f- just being at home. And also at the same time, like everyone, half the people that I knew were followed online were like, oh my gosh, now is the time to rest, reset, rebalance. Um, and I follow like a really fun blend of like very like spiritual business and also just funny things online. So I was like, ah, what do I do? Do I do or do I be or like, oh, and I was totally stuck in it. And it wasn't until I had a call with someone else. It was like, Camilla, you're allowed to make this time what you want it to be. Like if one day you want to work 12 hours and get a lot of stuff done and the next day you want to do nothing, like that's okay. And I was like, oh wow. Like sometimes it's, it's funny to me how much we lack the permission, like to give ourselves that permission uh, and just like let ourselves want whatever we want. And it's been really funny to watch because I have, I've had several days where I've worked really hard. I mean, the majority of the, um, of the time we've been, cause here in where I am, we've been in shelter in place. So, uh, we've haven't gone out really since the middle of March, um, at all. Um, and things are just now starting to, to look like we're about to reopen here in, in June or July. So, I spent like six weeks working, didn't take a single day off. And then I hit a wall and was like, nope, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, And then just start taking a lot of time off. So I think it's really just important, like any time in our lives, but really, it's really loud right now to make sure that we're clear on, on our own values and on what's going to feel best to us while still obviously remaining respectful of other people. Um, Because a lot of the times what I hear in this area, and I think it's really relevant right now is that people take like, yeah, do what you want as a, an ability or an excuse or permission to then, you know, trample on other people um, with that as a defense. And that's not (laughs) what it's about either. So um, there's a way I think to be mindful and respectful and honor yourself um, and also other honor other people. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, 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 I don't want. I don't want to talk too much about what's going on at the moment because everybody is talking about what's going on at the moment. But it's you know it's going to change. It's going to change the way things are for quite a long time. So I think it's it's really nice to hear somebody talk about the difference between wants and shoulds. So I don't know what what has happened in your area of the world, but in the UK, there's been like a rash of people baking banana bread. That's been the thing that everybody's been doing. You should be baking banana bread, and I'm like, I've never even heard of banana bread. What the hell's banana bread? Wow. Well, first of all, I love banana bread. So I wish there's a rash of people out here baking banana bread or maybe people in my own house doing that. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's funny because it's also like 
like we do with so many things, it's a perfect conglomerate of times of people being like, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Because if I tell some people like, yeah, you know, I'm working, I'm really busy right now. Um, I have so much stuff going on with the book and with my business. And then like some of those people are like, oh my gosh, like that sucks. Like I wish she had time to reset. And then if I tell other people like, yeah, you know, I'm resting, whatever. It's like, oh, Camilla, like, are you like, what, this is the time to work. And this is the time to like do the things you never had. The, and I'm just like, dang, if I wasn't as present to myself as I am at this point in my life and I wasn't as aligned and I hadn't been so forcefully checked at the beginning of all this, like I would probably be very confused and stressed out just by the conflicting messages. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a great representation and a great microcosm of like a lot of the stuff that we encounter in our lives, but in like in a blown up way. So. So how did you get to that point in your life? And you said that a while ago, you would have been like super confused and now you're a lot more together. So tell me a little bit about that. How did you how, share your secrets, please? Yeah. So I think, so it's funny because I, I talk about this a lot. I used to think I was really indecisive. Like I was like, oh my gosh, like any decision was so challenging for me to make, quote unquote. And so I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm just like, uh, but I knew at the, at, on the flip side of things that I had like really strong intuition and there were just certain things in life that just made sense. So like I once upended my life and was like, yeah, I don't want to breathe the same air as my high school ex-boyfriend. So I'm going to move to New York <laughs> where I've never been and known no one. Um, and so I did so. And I would do like, I have like those things, like the big things were all very easy for me to do, but the smaller things are more challenging. And it wasn't until, well, it really wasn't until I started writing my book and I was in a, I was in a conference and we were talking about values. And I realized that the thing that I was really good at was identifying my values and really knowing how to honor them. And in the middle of that conference, just from sitting down and having an honest conversation with myself about what, where my values were, I realized that the reason that I was indecisive and feeling kind of like, because I was just in major value conflict and what the driving force behind that was really the job that I was in was a job I was good at, but not a job I wanted to do anymore. Um, and so I had built up like this whole, you know, I've been in, in this career for five years. I've worked so hard. I had all these plans, like all these people are counting on me, like so much in my head. And yet if I got down to it, as I did on the floor of that <laughs> business conference, as I was sitting, taking notes, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like point blank. And the other piece of that is like learning how to not justify every decision that you make and explain it to people. Because when I sat down, like when my, I told my best friend who was part of my business plan for, um, it was actually this year, actually, she was really angry. She was like, wow, I should have seen this coming. Like, I can't believe that you would upend all the plans that we made. And I knew going into it, it was going to cause a lot of friction. And she was like, there's, she, she was talking to me. And I just remember telling her, I was like, yeah, no, I, I hear you. And like, I am one of the reasons that this was really challenging for me to come to this point was because I didn't want to disappoint you. But in getting louder with myself and more present with myself. I know that I cannot live life because I'm good at things and because I should be doing things. I have to do it because I want to be doing those things. And from then, that was like the loudest it's ever been of like my values just really coming in really hot. Um, and that was last December. And since then, it, like I can see now all my points of indecision was usually because I was scared of disappointing people or I thought that there was a way that I should be acting or should be responding to something. Um, and once you clear that out, like, okay, well, what do I want? And what's the most aligned decision? Um, everything gets so much, I think, simpler, not necessarily easier because a lot of these things aren't easy, but um, I think life gets a lot simpler once you're clear on your values um, and how they play across your life. And, and you can really have the ability to say, okay, what's the most aligned decision? Because a lot of time it, we put like a moral spin on it. And I used to do that a lot. I'd be like, what's the right decision or what's the, what's a good decision. Um, but if you put good and bad, like at the end of the day, like a decision's just a decision and you're going to have 18 million of them across your lifetime. So uh, being able to just say like, okay, what's the most aligned decision on a macro level in that like decision to shift my career was really important because I think especially since then, I mean, obviously I was doing it before then, but especially since December, like decisions are so easy for me now because it's just a matter of asking myself, like, what's the most aligned decision I can make right now? What do I actually want? 
Okay, that's that's really interesting, and I've got a couple of because I, I want to obviously want to talk about your book because that's what my podcast is. But I have a question for you, um, it, especially from what you said about your friend. It's really scary to talk to people about stuff like that, especially when you don't want to disappoint them, especially when you're someone who obviously cares a lot about other people, which is which you do. How did you how did you do that? How did you approach that decision and that conversation, and how did you get enough courage to to do it? Because I think a lot of people would be too scared. Yeah. So great question. So I kind of, I came to this point of like knowing what kind of had to be done, but I still sat in a group of people because we were doing like group sharing at this conference and I started crying. Like as soon as I opened my mouth, I was like, I have to make a decision. And then I was like, I'm just kidding. Like the decision's already made. I just don't know how to approach it. And I was talking to other people. And I think that oftentimes we go to other people to make those decisions instead of going to other people for support in having the conversations that we need to have. Um, so if going into that group of people with, Hey, this is a conversation I need to have really allowed me the support and the confidence in going to have it because all those people, I mean, yeah, at that point I could have given myself the validation, but I was in a really fragile moment that day. So those people were just like, Hey, Kamal, like you're right. Like that's, that's not a way to live your life. And you, I can see it in your eyes. Like this is not where you want to go. And you just need to like communicate that. And I'm, I like to go big or go home. So I don't waste my time. And I'm also a really bad liar. So I knew that I couldn't like live one more day with this hanging over my head. So I actually pulled her aside, like, at the, cause she was there. She was just not in the same part of the room as I was for the first half of the day. So she was at the conference. And then I just was like, I got checked myself and I said, I need to have this conversation right now. I get to have this conversation right now because I'm choosing to take my life in a different direction. And then I pulled her aside and was like, Hey, I need to talk to you about something really important. Um, and then I just like counted down in my head, a la Mel Robbins, like five, four, three, two, one, say it. And I was like, I'm not gonna, you know, answer, answer, answer it. So Cool. Thank you. It all happened very quickly, um, like from start to finish, I guess, throughout the day. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for answering that question. Um, let's talk, let's talk about your book, because obviously I am super excited about books in general and right now your book in particular. So tell me about the book that you wrote. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about your process of writing it. Yeah, great. Um, I'm, I love to talk about my book, so perfection. Uh, well, I think the first thing that I should say is on this topic of like aligned decision making, deciding to write my book was one of those things. So a couple of years ago, I went to a business conference. Me and business conferences just changed my <laughs> life <laughs> left and right. Um, but it was this one particular conference and I, I was at it and I don't know why, Vicky, I'm, I'm not really quite sure, but my arms started... Um, going up when they were raffling things um, and having bids um, more than I wanted it to. Like I wasn't really connected, but all of a sudden I found myself like having bought like a lunch with this person and a this with this person. And I was like, wow, like I'm really like people started to get, this was a 400 person conference and people would see me and be like, oh yeah, you're the, you're the girl who's bought everything. And I was like, yeah, me and my bank account are just as shocked as you are. Um, and in this process, one of the things that I randomly bid on that ended up really being life-changing was a dinner with this guy who had founded self-publishing school. His name's Chandler Bolt. And yeah. I bought the, th I don't, I don't know. He was talking on stage and talking about how you have to write your first book on something you can talk all day about, that it should not be your gut-wrenching memoir. That it should be like your one and done, like go hard, go heavy so that you can learn the book writing process. You can get better. And either way, like your first book's not going to be your best book. So anyways, I went to dinner with him and I had like thought about this and I was like, man, I just think this is like really weird idea for a book. But my, and as he was talking was like, you have to write this book. And so I, I like kind of pitched it to him as we were walking to dinner and he looked at me and he's like, oh my gosh, is that thing on pre sale He was like, I'd buy that. And I was like, oh shit, uh, like Chandler Bolt would buy my book. I was like, okay, cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. And then throughout dinner, I was just like, all right, I guess I have to do this. And I, so I decided to buy into like his program because he like coaches people on how to do that. And he has like this massive company that does that. Uh, and again, my bank account was like, hey, what are you doing there? Um, but when I went to the sales meeting and I pitched it again to this guy, he was like, wow, no, like that sounds really 
really weird and like I don't never heard of someone writing a book on that so like you should do it and then I called my fiance and I was like hey so I kind of want to buy this thing but it's like a lot and (laughs) I'm really not sure where that's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen like I just got back from living three months abroad like and he was like is now the time and I said yeah now that's the time and he was like well then buy it and so I was like okay so I bought it And so by now everyone's like, oh my God, what is this book about? Is it like some mythical race of dinosaurs? It's not actually. Um, It is a guide for men on using their dating apps and optimizing their dating app profiles. Um, And I've been in the, or I was in the online space, like freelancing for about five years, rewriting men's profiles, which is like a very weird thing to do in college. Like some people are like, oh yeah, like, you know, I bus tables. And I was like, Haha, yeah, I rewrite, you know, grown men's profiles on Tinder. Uh, so, but then again, I sold knives in college too. It's so needed though. I've got a friend who actually, we used to talk about that because she, she's really good. She's like, I'm going to, I'm going to write, rewrite people's dating profiles. This is when she was dating. And I was like, you totally should do that. So I think it's, I, I love the fact that you did it. It's great. And I love the title of your book as well. It's just perfect. <laughs> Yeah. And it, you know, what's funny is I was agonizing over this title for months. Like I was like, oh my gosh, what do I call it? Like, what do I even say? Like, do I call it? Cause I was trying to really appear to like appeal to like the, you know, like high powered. Cause Vicky, you would be surprised. A lot of my clients back in those days when I was doing it for like $10, God help me. Like, what was I doing back then? But anyways, a lot of those men were like very successful, like business owners. Like I wrote one for the this guy who's on like Arizona's 30 under 30, like we're not talking like a, f- you know, 40 year old man. That's like, I am insecure about myself. Like, no, we're talking dudes that are just like, I am really high level everything I do in my life. And I don't care to not be high level. So go write my thing. Like even their Tinder bio, they outsource. And so I was trying to really hard to appeal to that kind of man. And I was like, I am so far from that man. Like, I am a bisexual Colombian woman. I was like, there is, there is no, like, it is all the alpha man. So I finally, I was just laying in bed one day and I was like, I think I'm just going to call it swipeable. That's what we're going to do. Yep. Okay, great. That sounds good to me. That sounds good to me. Yep. And then that, it was done. Like there was no consultation. People are like, oh yeah. And I was like, yep, this is the title of my book. This is going to happen. Um, and it's been great. People keep asking me like where, you know, where I got the name and where I like, wow, how'd you come up with that? I was like, I have no idea. It just was, I was laying in bed and it just ah, light bulb. And uh, then we ran with it. So I was not going to question at that point after agonizing over it. I think it's, no, it's a great title. It's perfect. It does exactly what it says on the tin. And I can totally see how it would appeal to the type of man that you were um, targeting as well. Because it's, it's just like the high powered kind of, yeah, swipeable. I want to be swipeable. It's great. Yeah. So tell me about the writing process and how did you find the actual process of writing the book? Did you enjoy it? Um, It was brutal uh, (laughs) because I am a, well, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So one of the things that that we talk about in self-publishing school is getting words out on paper and editing after. Like you're not allowed to backspace a lot. You're not allowed to self-edit while you're writing. Like do not. And that was the, that was the hardest part for me because I would write something and be like, that's trash, but I have to keep going. (laughs) And so it was just like, oh my God, it's so (laughs) grueling. Yeah, it's what we call the shitty first draft. And it's like, it's, yeah, it has to be because everything in the time that every, in the time of all good things, there was a time when it was shit. Right, exactly. And so that's what I kept reminding myself. And there were a couple of times that I wrote a sentence. I was like, okay, that is actually one of the worst sentences I've ever written in my life. I'm going to backspace that one and rephrase that a little bit. But besides that, I didn't do any major editing. I just kind of like ran with it. Um, And I was actually writing my senior thesis for one, uh, for two of my degrees at the time. So it was I hell in a handbasket only because I was writing a lot and thinking really critically. And then at the same time coming home being like, also, I have to go write this book. Um, so it was challenging for that reason. But at the end of the day, like it actually got done way in like smaller sittings. And I thought it was going to like the number of sittings. Like there was one morning where I had a call with my writing coach, power of accountability, um, at, at like eight 30. And I was like, wow, I am nowhere near done with my rough drafts, but like, I just told him it would be done. And I 
hate disappointing people. And I also like, I'm so tired of just putting this off. And so I woke up that morning at 3 a.m. And this was like my saving grace because it was, I was kind of tired. So it was just like, you know, I got to keyboard and I typed out like 5,000 words before our call. And I got on our call that day and I was like, hello, I have now finished my rough draft. <laughs> Nice. Um, just now. And he laughed and, and then it was done. It was like, by the end of that day, like the rough draft was done and then stuff got added to it. But, um, most of it came from that, like one sitting of just like really letting it down. And that's what I tell a lot of people when they're challenged writing is just like, honestly, like if you wake up at 3am one day when you're like half asleep and your brain can just kind of go on autopilot, like sometimes you can get a, like a lot of stuff done because you're not overthinking it. Yeah. So did you, well, did, I mean, you said it was brutal. And I think that, I think that writing a book is a brutal process for a lot of people. It's, I'm particularly impressed that you managed to just splurge your shitty first draft out without doing too much self-editing, because that's the thing that most people struggle most with. So I am so impressed. How did you find the discipline to do that? Um, honestly, I talked to myself quite a bit. So anytime I would want to start going, I was like, nope. I would like just start having a rant to myself. I was like, Mila, I swear to God, you, t- nope, you type down, go further down. Like, nope, we are going to edit later. It is shit. Everyone's book is shit the first time. Do not, do not, do not. And then it was just like that, like for every single time. Um, and I also called one of my friends who's, uh, who studied English and she's just like, studied literature and she would just be like, yeah, Camilla, do not edit it. And I'd be like, <laughs> so bad and she'd be like yeah I don't care just keep going and I'd be like okay so (laughs) yeah you gotta have different strategies (laughs) depending on the day um but yeah it was really that was the hardest part of it It was just not not doing that and also like if you're gonna self-publish there's so much that goes into that like so many tiny steps so many questions you don't even know are questions like I'm an avid book reader and there was so much stuff that goes into like the production of a book that I had no idea was even yeah. a question so yeah people people are really surprised about just <laughs> it's like and then they have a new appreciation of how amazing books are when they realize how much stuff goes into the background oh my god for real I feel so guilty I'd like to formally apologize to any author whose book I have gotten an EPUB of off the internet for whatever reason in my younger days I'm so sorry I <laughs> nowadays like when <laughs> my friends send me EPUBs of something and I was like oh my god please send me their Amazon link too because I'm gonna have to go buy their books now I have this overwhelming guilt so I'm like I can't do that to them <laughs> Cool. So tell me about tell me about the editing process. Then. So after you got your shitty first draft down, how did how did you go about editing? How did that make you feel? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the first thought was like, wow, well, this is shit. Um, and then I was like, great, because I had to like rework it. Because I had started in one kind of like, oh, I'm going to take it in this direction. Because pro tip, make sure that you actually outline in an outline that you feel really good about. Because I felt decent about my outline, I feel like amazing about it, and then like two chapters and I was like oh wow I have this brilliant idea now and then I changed it and so that my first two chapters did not make sense like the way that they were structured so I had to be like okay cool 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 so that made my editing like a lot (laughs) slower um but thankfully again I talked to myself all the time so I was just able to just like talk to myself and read it out loud which was also challenging and then just like knock it out so I did it around myself and then I sent it off to someone else to help me edit um and then after it came back from her then I took it over and I like finished everything up so you just have to have a lot of grace for yourself and a lot of patience um and a lot of love because like yeah there are gonna be stuff that you say that you later look on and you're like why in the world would I write that word next to that word but you did. And it's fine. Cause that's what backspace is for. Um, I honestly have no idea how people wrote on typewriters, like God bless them because I, there would have just been, I would have, it would have taken me 10 years to write this book and it's not a big book. Um, so we would have been challenged. Um, so yeah. So just a lot of patience, a lot of grace for myself, especially once I came back from editor, like everything was read and I like, I'm a funny person uh at least in my own head and a lot of the humor is what Haley took out of my my editor Haley she took out of the book she was like this doesn't land this is trying too hard this doesn't read it was so hard for me I was like but that's so funny but like 
I was like, okay, but like, I trust this person and I understand. And it was funny because like the lines that I thought were like the least funny, like there's a line in there that says like, at, like men with animals in their pictures, like statistically get more r- swipes to the right. And then in parentheses, I wrote like, that doesn't include the bass you just caught, like skip the fish. She thought this was the most hilarious line of all. She was like, oh my God, I love this. And I was like, Haley, I literally added that like a spur of the moment. Like, oh yeah, that would be kind of amusing. Like it was not funny, but all the things I thought were like, eh, she was like, wow, this is funny. This is humor. And everything else, she was like, this is trash. So I took out so much of the funny side of things, but now reading back, like it feels a lot better and it feels a way more smoother um, because it is it's hard sometimes to translate humor into writing and especially when you're writing to a very different demographic than yourself um, it you have to be even more mindful of that so challenging but I mean at the end it was like that when it came back from editor I think that's when I was like wow this is like a real thing that's starting to happen now <laughs> Yeah. I think also humor, certainly for me, humor is a defense mechanism that I go to when I'm, when I'm scared, I automatically default to clown mode. And so I wonder if perhaps that's one of the reasons that your editor is like, because you, everybody is scared when they're writing their first book. Cause I'm like, ah, this is going to be really shit. Everybody's going to hate it. And, oh. and so that was probably a reason, but I also have a question to ask you. Are you a fan of Brooklyn Nine-Nine? I am. <laughs> oh, so, cause it was like, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah cool 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 yeah I um it's funny you say that because last night I watched Terry Crews's new movie and with my fiance because he was like well did you know Terry Crews has a new movie out and so we watched it spoiler alert it was not good and uh, halfway through I was like I don't think Terry's proud of this <laughs> and he was like yeah, I don't either. Like, I did not think it was going to go this way, but I feel like we're obligated as fans of his to just finish watching it. And we were like, okay. So we powered through till the end. Um, but it's okay, Terry. We still love you. Um, you're still a champion in our minds. Oh, with that segue, because we're massive fans of um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and my husband's always like, cool, 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 cool. And so it just cracked me up every time he said it. Um, right, what was I? I had an actual question for you that was going to be useful to people instead of just like a fan of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, <laughs> Um, while I'm thinking of it, go go watch Brooklyn Nine Nine, people, because it's very funny. Um, yeah. So, how are you? How are you selling your book? Let's talk about that a little bit. So, how's how's where are you selling it? Is it on Amazon? What are you doing with it? Yeah. So, so I've all sold on Amazon right now. Uh, that's like the primary thing. There is. I'm going to go through Ingram Spark, which is what we use here in the states and um, and in the UK as well, to do some like smaller things. It was just. Swipeable launched exactly <laughs> two weeks before everything sort of shut down <laughs> in the United States. Um, so pros of that, I've had a lot of time to think like post launch and like there's lots of plans that I've made, like the summer is going to be really good. Um, and, but on the flip side of things, I was not very motivated to work with my local bookstores and do all that sort of stuff on, on the publishing distribution side. So once we're actually like back in gear, which I estimate will be like towards the end of the year, then so I will be found, you know, like in your smaller, cause I really do want it in library, smaller bookshops and that sort of thing. Um, cause I'm really big about book accessibility. And, and on the flip side, um, I will also be selling it like on my own website once that's all done and glorious awesome that's really exciting um we're running out of time sadly which makes me sad um because i absolutely love talking to you i'm gonna have to get you back again at some point i think um because there's so many more questions to ask you um but finally uh where can we find out more about you camilla for sure you can laugh with me or at me it's what i like to say um on instagram so it's at camilla one l if you put two then it means stretcher in spanish so don't do that um camilla underscore a r r i awesome and we'll put that link in the show notes as well and i'm also going to pop a link to your book swipeable in the show notes too because i am a big fan of getting um my authors my students to go read other books that people have self-published um because self-publishing is awesome and we need to do more of it more good books as well that's that's my thing is it's more good books and so it's really really cool that um you've produced a fantastic book it's very very exciting um so camilla thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast i really appreciate it Um, and yeah thank you vicky it's been fab talking to you um and in the meantime um you can 
well, next week my husband will be back, Joe will be back, we'll be arguing about something to do with writing and business. Um, in the meantime, you can go listen to any of these podcast episodes on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Please leave us a review. We love reviews. Um, five stars or however many stars you think it deserves. But, you know, if you don't like it, other podcasts are available. Um, and we'll be back same time next week. Thank you so much. Peace out. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm-hmm.